Okay, another, um, another participant in our reading group uh, was Margaret Atwood. And Margaret Atwood, uh, when she joined the group, said, um, made the comment that we're talking about the future. And she said, I don't believe there is uh, the future. I think there are many futures. And the future that we get is the future we deserve. Uh, we, need to, we need to choose our path. And one of the, the big questions here is you know, what, what Rich was talking about and the, developing these types of synthetic minds uh, is the extent to which they are human-like. And so now we're shifting to a debate of what is perhaps the, the most central question in this whole category. The debate question is, be it resolved that human-like intelligence is the wrong focus for our work. This was precipitated by a paper that Professor Brynjolfsson uh, published from, uh, from Stanford, where I opened this morning uh, describing to you the Turing trap. The Turing trap and, and the test of the, of the ability to deceive. And then I compared that to the ability to do an action. And I asked Andreas to bring a cup of coffee. What I did was I gave him a goal. I specified the goal and then he had to figure out all the steps in order to bring the cup of coffee. Right, Rich, he had a goal. <laughs> and he took whatever he'd learned in the past to assemble the set of tasks, the verbs and nouns that he needed to execute in order to come up on the stage and hand me a cup of coffee when he'd had no preparation for doing that work. Nobody gave him a standing ovation because nobody thought that was spectacular. Even though the most powerful machines in the world today can't that cup of coffee. So, uh, welcome Professor Brynjolfsson from Stanford and Professor Joshua Gans, my colleague from the University of Toronto. They are going to debate what, for many of us, in our view, is the single most important uh, topic in this general field uh, regarding human-like intelligence. Professor Brynjolfsson, you're up first. Thank you, Professor Agarwal. Whoop, coffee. First off, thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm really honored. This, I'm amazed by what you've assembled here. And uh, I very, very much want to pick up on what Jordi just said about how we're in a really interesting and amazing time in history. And it forces me, at least, and I think all of us, to think a little bit more about what we value and what we care about and, and where we want to go with this technology. And so let me um, outline what I'm going to talk about very briefly, and then I'll go into a little more detail. I want to make four main points. The first one is that there's amazing benefits to human-like artificial intelligence. And we heard about some of them in terms of being able to uh, save us a lot of labor. Uh, the world is made for humans, as Suzanne was saying, and so uh, human-like intelligence is one that will fit right in. Um, and we didn't touch on this, but I think it'll give us a better understanding of ourselves, which is maybe the profit. But the second point I want to make is that as ambitious as that goal is, in many ways, it's not ambitious enough. I think in a few years, we're going to come to the conclusion that human-like intelligence is actually a very narrow and meager kind of intelligence. While it seems very aspirational, or it was when Alan Turing set that goal, um, it's only one kind of intelligence. There are many other kinds of intelligences that ultimately can do far more things. Already, we have intelligences that can do far more than humans, and we should think about those broader kinds of intelligences. Thirdly, I want to make the case that human-like intelligence has some unfortunate economic implications. The more human-like a machine is, the better substitute it is for humans, almost. Substitutes tend to drive down the values of the things that they're substitutes for. So human-like machines will tend to reduce the value of human-like labor or human labor. And in the limit, when there's no more demand for labor, then the uh, value of labor will go to zero, which maybe isn't such a bad thing, but it means that people who control capital will have the economic and political power. And that's something we're going to have to grapple with. We need to think carefully where there's that kind of reallocation and concentration, potentially, of wealth and power. And fourthly, I want to make the case that we have a lot of choices 
ahead of us. And that we, as all of the speakers, Jordy and, and everyone else has been saying, um, we have to think about our values and our choices. Rich Sutton was saying that. Um, but right now, there are, there's good reason to believe that our choices are being skewed because the incentives are steered much more towards substitution than to complementing. Whether it's the tax code and policymakers, I think Daron may have spoken about this yesterday, um, whether it's the way that managers think about work and entrepreneurs think about work, whether it's the way technologists think about it, I'll make the case that all of those groups have excess incentives for substitution and insufficient incentives for, for complementing and augmenting. As a consequence, we can't rely on the market or natural forces to automatically get us to the right choice. We have to be more proactive about steering us to a better balance. So let me go into more detail about each of those points. Um, so we already heard about Alan Turing. Uh, not surprisingly, a number of us have touched on that. Uh, 73 years ago, he thought deeply about what it would mean to be intelligent. And as uh, Ajay was saying, he came up with this idea of the imitation game. You can see it right there in the title. His, his concept of measuring intelligence was to literally mimic, imitate humans. Interesting idea. I think it's very terribly wrong. It is not the right metric of intelligence. But it's one that's inspired people for a long time. And maybe that didn't matter so much when, we were, when it was far, far away. Thousands of years ago, people were talking about mimicking humans. Uh, Daedalus, the mythical engineer, talked about making robots that were just like humans, if you read the mythology. Uh, about uh, 100 years ago, uh, Carol Chapek, universal robots. That's where the word came from, from his play about robots. Um, but now we're beginning to see real robots. I should have put up uh, one of the uh, sanctuary robots. I'll have to do that next time, but I didn't have a picture. Um, but we are getting humanoid robots, whether it's Elon Musk or Jordy Rose and Suzanne or others. We're seeing that we're getting actually really close. This is not so mythical anymore. And probably in the next few years, we'll be seeing some robots that are the ones that people only talked about in stories. And of course, all of you here have played around with Midjourney and uh, ChatGPT and are seeing that we're getting interactions that in some ways kind of are beginning to pass the Turing test, at least a very simple version of it. And it's not unrealistic to think that with, by 2029 or sometime soon, we'll be, pass, we'll be passing those thresholds. In fact, um, if you go to a website like Sanctuary, like uh, Metaculus, and you look at some of the goals that uh, people are thinking will be achieved in the near years, um, just a couple of years ago, less than 18 months ago, it was 2059 was when people thought we would get artificial general intelligence. And, and on the website, there's a whole set of criteria of what that means, what, how to define that, passing a very adversarial two-hour Turing test, assembling things physically, passing a whole bunch of other tests. Standards, and I thought that was probably outside my lifespan. I'm not quite sure how long I'll live. But now, you can see up in the right corner there, the prediction is it's 2032. In 18 months, it's come in tremendously. So we are now on the cusp, as Jordy was just saying, of really achieving some of those things that previously were only mythological or hypothetical. So let's think a little bit about what this. I'm gonna lay out 10 basic theses for the what I call the Turing trap. And I mentioned that there are tremendous benefits of human-like intelligence. All the other speakers are talking about that. Joshua is gonna go into detail, so I won't spend too much time other than what I already said about that. I also want to say that most types of intelligence are not human-like, and it's overly narrow to focus only on human-like intelligence. There are uh, chimpanzees who have better short-term memory. My calculator can do math better. ChatGPT can read or summarize entire a summary for an accountant or for a marketing professor or whatever perspective you want. These are things that are alien, in fact, Demis Hassabis of DeepMind said this is like an alien intelligence. It's very different than human intelligence in terms of what it's able to do. Now, the more you make a machine like a human, the more it is a substitute. Makes sense. But that has some implications. By definition, substitutes lower the demand for the thing they're the substitute for. Economist, uh, the cross price elasticity is positive. A higher price drives up the price. A lower price drives down the price. So more substitutable means driving down 
the substitute humans in this case. Some people call that automation. That's what David Otter calls it. That's what Daron Asimoglu calls it. In my paper, I sometimes use that term. But I think uh, I'm realizing after some, reading some of Joshua's stuff, I need to be more precise. Uh, automation is sort of a loose term. I think substitution is a nice term. And I, I've, used, I've been using those a little interchangeably. As you lower this thing, you also reduce its economic power. And in most cases, it's political power. Uh, it's been said that you can have great concentration of wealth and democracy, but you can't have both. Um, so I think that as you do have more concentration of economic power, you're likely to have more concentration of political power as well. And if the people who lose that power no longer have agency, that creates a trap. It's difficult for them to change the situation. It's a bad equilibrium to be in when you have no economic and political power. And so we want to be careful about getting into that equilibrium and leaving a lot of people in that equilibrium. That's what I call the Turing trap. But I also want to emphasize that's not the only path. There's another path, which is to use AI to augment people. Douglas Engelblatt and others have emphasized that you can use AI to increase the capabilities of humans, to augment them, to allow them to do new things that were never done before, not simply replace what they're already doing. Call that augmenting. Elasticity in that case is negative, which means that lower prices for the technology increase the value of human labor and, and increase wages. And in fact, that's not a, a corner, a weird situation. That's what most technologies have been doing for most of history. Today, wages are about 10 times higher than they were a couple hundred years ago because most technologies have primarily augmented us rather than substituted for us. So that's a, a common path and one we can continue. Not only does augmenting complement, but more broadly, I use that term also to include extending our capabilities, allowing us to do new things. And that's the way David Otter and others do in their recent papers. Um, most progress comes from new goods and services, not from doing the same things more cheaply. And finally, as I said a little earlier, I want to emphasize this, is that um, there are excess incentives right now for substitution. Both of these can create value. Some things replaced. I'd like to have some things augmented, but the market is not getting it right. We have our thumb on the scale skewing things more towards substitution, and I'll show you the, the math on that in a little while. So let me talk a little bit more about the Turing test in action. Um, one of my erstwhile Stanford colleagues, he's passed away now, Nils Nilsson, said that the definition of achieving human-like intelligence me would mean going through each of the tasks that humans are currently doing and then having a machine do each of them, step by step, a little like Suzanne was laying out. And he laid out a, a paper uh, about human-level AI about it, where he explained how we needed to be very meticulous, identifying what we do now and having a machine that could do each of those tasks. So that's uh, a, a very literal interpretation of the Turing test. Let's see if we can imitate humans. But let's just think through, suppose he had succeeded, or let's go back to Daedalus, that mythical engineer. Let's suppose he had succeeded. He, supposedly, he was making these humanoid robots. Let's say, OK, let's say he, he made a machine that did everything the ancient Greeks did. But to sharpen our intuition, suppose they did only what the Greeks did. Well, what would that mean? Good news. We would have a clicker, yes. We would be able to make clay pottery completely automated. We have as much free clay pots as we want, weaving tunics, repairing horse-drawn carts. I think you see where this is going. You're feeling sick? No problem. If you have a cough like uh, Ajay had earlier, you can bring, get a cup of coffee or maybe get some incense burned. All that stuff would be completely free. Good news. But you can also see that maybe our limit is high. There'd be no iPhones, no I MRA vaccines, no supersonic jets. To be a little bit more formal about it, productivity is defined as output divided by input. Very simple formula. Uh, most economists operationalize that as G GDP divided by hour worked. So let's think about what we could do if we automated all the work. Send labor to zero. We'd have a life of leisure. That's great. What would productivity be? Infinity. Productivity would be infinite. Sounds hard to beat that. But if GDP didn't change, that, OK, that's great. We have leisure, but we're not really having that big an increase in living standards. It gets worse. 
if labor hours go to zero, how much money does laborers work? How much money do laborers make? Zero. So there's also a big distributional outcome as well. Simply automating is appealing. It has some benefits, but it's too narrow a goal. Productivity is not everything, even if it's infinite. And this is, not, you know, there's a story there. There's some math. Look at some data. This is not hypothetical. Here's a chart from David Otter, and there's lots more. There's a giant economic literature on this. I've contributed some to it. Um, let's look at the wages. The blue line, that's us in this room here at the top. Wages have been going up for you college graduates, you postdoctoral researchers, you professors and engineers. That's nice. But look at the red line. Not so good. Real wages for high school graduates or people who didn't complete high school have actually fallen in real terms, both for men and for women have done a little better, but the broad pattern is very similar. And it's not just wages. The chart on the right is what's happening to uh, deaths from despair, as Anne Case and her husband Angus Deaton call it. Look at the red line again. This time the red line's going up. Oh, but that's not so good news because in this chart, up is bad. Up is more deaths. So opioids, suicide, uh, alcoholism, depression, They've gone up substantially. I was astonished to see that in the United States, life expectancy started falling, not just during COVID, but in about 2015. So there's a big group of people who aren't benefiting. To be clear, college graduates still doing all right, but there's a growing gap. And I want to say there's a lot of reasons for that, but a lot of economists, a lot of sociologists think part of it is the way technology has rolled out and affected different groups, affected the job prospects of different groups. So let's talk a little bit about the incentives. Now, I'm an economist, and there's this great thing that they teach econ students when they first show up, the first fundamental welfare theorem, the first fundamental welfare theorem. You get a Pareto optimal allocation if you let a free market decide everything. So sit back, the market can take care of it. However, it depends on two important assumptions. One is that there's unchanging production possibilities frontier. You just have a static rearrangement. Does it seem like this technology is going to leave things unchanging? No. So that's probably not a good assumption. Secondly, that there's no externalities, that my utility is not affected when I see somebody dying in the street. So that also isn't a good assumption. So let me just lay out what, how the three groups have different incentives, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Policymakers. Policymakers have been subsidizing substitution versus complements, and our tax system is subsidizing capital over labor. Consider two entrepreneurs, maybe two of them sitting in this room right now here, they each have a billion dollar idea, it's probably a $10 billion idea for uh, the Creative Destruction Lab. Alice and Bob. Alice is, employs 1,000 workers, Bob's employs 1,000 robots or 1,000 machines. Okay, get at it. Government says, no, 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 no. We are not going to treat them the same. The one that uses more laborers is going to have to pay more taxes, and the one that uses more capital will pay less taxes. It, in Canada, it's, that rate is half on capital what it is on labor. So essentially, the government has put its thumb on the scale and is trying to steer technology in one way versus the other. It's not a level playing field. Executives and entrepreneurs also have biased incentives. Um, if a executive comes up with a new idea that will automate some of the work, it will make the economic pie bigger, that's a good thing, but it will also shift some of the rents, some of the value from labor to capital. That's a zero-sum benefit, yet the executive will have an incentive to do it, even aside from the taxes. And finally, technologists, I think this is more of a conceptual thing, but as I talk to them, I see them also being quite enamored by the Turing test. Um, and I'm sometimes a victim of this as well. Look at the white circle. That's the set of all the tasks that humans can do. We can enumerate them, we can try at least, and we can try to make that black circle bigger and bigger to accomplish more and more. But the real action is the stuff that we can't see very well that's outside the spotlight. That's all the things we haven't thought of yet that have not yet been discovered. That's where we should be focusing our energy. In many ways, matching the Turing test is not ambitious enough. It's also quite hard. As Ajay's example showed, getting a cup of coffee or picking blueberries may be something that's easy for a, a human to do, but difficult for a machine to do. 
there are lots of other things that are easy for machines to do, like fly at supersonic speeds, or summarize entire books, or figure out protein folding algorithms. Uh, these are things that humans can't do. So there's a, a trade-off there. As I said at the beginning, there's this path of replicating humans, imitating humans, that Nils Nilsson and Alan Turing talked about. The other part is what uh, Doug Engelbart talked about, which is using technology to extend what we do, augment what we do. While both of them can create value, we right now have excessive incentives for substitution rather than complementing. And there's, that's why I'd like to ask all of you to think harder about that broader space that's out there to augment, not simply replace humans, and think about what our values are, what kind of a world we want in terms of creating a higher ceiling, but also creating one that creates benefits for the many and not just the few. Thanks very much. So Eric arguing that we are largely on the wrong path res with respect to building, focusing on human-like intelligence because of this substitution issue. And Joshua Gans taking the other side that no, we are indeed on the right path. Yeah, so Eric uh, uh, asks us uh, you know, to think about what we want. Um, I'll tell you what I want. I want more automation. My slides, uh... no, it's, uh... oh, okay. So I think we should devote more effort to making human-like intelligence. And moreover, apparently this isn't the right clicker. Is yours working? Oh, got it, it works. Great. Um, and, and we should spend more time on making machines that imitate human cognition. So I'm gonna hard, hard the other direction. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone recognizes who this is. Uh, this looks like a, uh, someone who might have been an undertaker in Kansas City in the late 19th century. Um, this is Alman Stroger, um, and he was an undertaker in Kansas City in the late 19th century. <laughs> and he uh, was singularly responsible for automation that killed the largest uh, job employment task, uh, job employment category in the, in the world uh, throughout the 20th century. And he did this by building this. This is the automated uh, telephone switch. What it replaced was this. The uh, people who were operating the, the switches to be able to connect calls uh, and uh, with the largest job category and the people being replaced were mostly, uh, were almost, almost entirely women uh, with high school degrees. Why? He didn't like them. It's not that he like the machines, he didn't like the women. He wanted to create a girlless, custless, out of orderless and weightless system. Now he had an interest in doing this because uh, in his small town in Kansas City there were two undertakers. And he suspected that the calls weren't coming through to him when someone carked it. And the reason uh, was because the wife of the uh, person who ran the other undertaking service was also the switchboard operator. And so he said, I had enough of this. Now, most people who had enough of this would like lower the price, do some advertising. He decided I'm wiping them all out, all of them. Okay, so this is the evil mindset that Eric is definitely railing against. So, you know, we can make machines that imitate human cognition. That's one thing we've been shown. That's why this is a salient issue. And recently, we've uh, shown this we're in terms of uh, chat GPT. We can, and I can't tell you how many journalists suddenly rang me up and say, I'm worried about this now. Uh, I can be replaced because uh, ChatGPT can write. And so you take a job like writing, a task like writing a letter, and would you now can do it fully with a, with a, a machine. Uh, you don't have to do it. But actually, if you think about it a little carefully, that's not what it's telling us. Sure, the machine, you could now have ChatGPT write a letter, replacing the human doing so. But it's not that, actually, when you think about it. For starters, ChatGPT is just sitting there. You have to say what you want the letter to be, what you want its tent to be, what you want it to describe, etc. Then ChatGPT can write the letter. Then, before you send the letter, you have to sign off on it. You have to look at it and say, did it actually do what I want? It turns out those two parts were part of every writing task. We have to do that all the time. We just didn't think about it because it was all bundled together. 
the technologies have forced us to separate it out, but you'll notice we've divided between a task that's laborious, the automation of the writing of the letter part, and the task that is a bit more cognitive, not. So we've taken this task and we've divided it, understood it better, and now we can actually take away the unpleasant part of it, this sort of crafting this uh, letter. Stroger wasn't able to just invent the automated switch. Uh, this is uh, you know, Neil Rain Wainwright's here. He'll recognise what this is. He used it in his. Uh, this is a. This is a. Uh, this is a, a, a dial telephone. Of course, they didn't have that, and they didn't need that until you needed a means by which the computer, the humans, were able to talk to the machine and tell them what call to do. Previously, they would talk to another human who would do all of that. So they had to invent this thing as well. Um, by the way, this Stroger got a patent on this and the basic template for that spread throughout the world. So he was literally responsible for that out of spite. Imitated cognition essentially bakes in, it bakes in an ability to work with people. It's not simply that they're trying to replicate the human intelligence, but it also has to bake in the interface as well, and it's a very easy path to do that. We have enough trouble understanding people and relating to different cultures, let alone relating to different intelligences. And in fact, the entire history of the adoption of computers has been a problem of getting the people to work with the computers. And we're seeing revolution in that regard. The question is, what are they imitating? What they're imitating is, are we, I'm gonna, <laughs> what, uh, I'll demonstrate. What they imitate is, uh, uh, this is, this is uh, a person learning to uh, uh, become a taxi driver in London, studying for several years to learn the routes between two different locations and all different locations, a huge problem. Um, now we have AI to help with that task. There's a recent paper, gave AI to some taxi drivers in Tokyo that would predict where to drive to for demand. But what's interesting is who, who it was useful for. It raised everybody's productivity, but it raised, actually, when they dug into it, the productivity and least skilled drivers. For the most experienced drivers, it didn't help them at all. So what did it imitate? It imitated, it allowed a low-skilled person to imitate a high-skilled one. What does that mean? Um, well, we have other situations. Here's, here's a similar result in a customer service uh, environment where these tools increase 40% on average uh, skill, uh, unskilled workers. And who's the author of that? My esteemed colleague over here, Eric Brinsjolfsson. So he, he's well aware of this. So machines in, uh, who imitate human skills can increase labor access and productivity. Of course, they have a consequence. These schools that taught the taxi drivers shut down. But don't panic. Why? Even in Almond Stroger's case, this happened in 1892, but actually all of the employment happened after that point. People found it worthwhile to stack up and build the largest employment category knowing there was a machine sitting there right there. Why? Because the machine was harder to work with, harder to work with, uh, it, it was costly despite whatever tax incentives there may have been. So I don't want anyone to give up on automating. I want more and to really continue to do this. I'm not saying do none of the other stuff, but this. Don't be discouraged. Thank you. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So thanks very much, Joshua. We've asked uh, five members of the CDL community if they can, uh, they're each going to have two minutes to comment or question. Uh, for the debaters, you can take notes, and then they'll each get their uh, closing comments after hearing from the five. Uh, Sinead, and uh, as I introduce each person, just to save us on time, their bios will be up on the screen, uh, and we'll go right into their comments. Okay. Uh, two great debates. Um, and I think in the context of work, we should think of AI as less as artificial intelligence, but more as the application of human intelligence. Because the value we seek to extract from AI is a direct reflection of our human intelligence, which is why if you were to give King Tut and Alan Turing access to the same human level AI system, they would apply it in entirely different ways. Because AI is a reflection of who humans are at that particular moment in time which means we do not need to superficially design AI uh, to simply augment or complement jobs, because that's already a feature built into these systems. We should seek to push beyond the upper limit 
In fact, it's only through automating human muscle that we are all in this room today debating the automation of potential cognition. So what could be past this current upper boundary of what we think is possible in the labor market as we push forward? Thanks. This was a, it's a great debate. Um, and I'd read uh, Eric's paper first. I didn't get to read Josh's comments, so some of mine are kind of uh, repeated. I don't know my slides are going to show. Do yeah, we can go to your slides. Yeah. Okay, next one. Next, next slide. Next slide. Okay, so this is Eric's picture, and the key central issue here is kind of artificial intelligence or intelligence augmentation. And I think Eric's point is very good that there is a set of tasks that you know machines could automate, and then there's a bigger set that humans are already doing that machines might have trouble automating for a while. And then there's this big giant white space um, where uh, we're enabling humans to do things they couldn't even do. You know, why aren't we spending more of energy there, right? So he's basically got um, you know substituting for humans is just socially bad. Right, so there's a big risk and a big cost there, and then if you just don't even try, there's this other region that you can go and do. Okay, so um, I think then you know to uh, the next point, which is more of Josh's point. There's actually let's focus on not whether it's sort of human of AGI, right? Trying to actually make things that can do really intelligent, you know, capable things, whether or not it's to try to replace humans. That's not what it, no one's really trying to replace humans, right? We're trying to basically make the most, uh, you know, advanced intelligence instance we can, human-like actually or not. So um, there's actually a big region where just doing that work is going to cover a wide swath of human um, tasks, and yes, there will be substitution. And there's going to actually be a wide swath of tasks that humans were never even able to do. Um, there's scale, audit, just doing the same thing humans do, but doing it repeatedly at scale, reliably, 24 by 7, and networked you know, gives you huge wins in itself. So there's just a much giant region of tasks in Eric's, uh, you know, area that's going to be hit by the same work of AGI. Um, and then there's the other category, which I do think is neglecting this wide swath of things, whether or not it's, it's AGI type of technology, what are the things we could do that could amplify, that could address the most tasks that no one's able to address already. There's just a giant white space. So I think my resolution is really it's, it's both. Um, you know, both are true. Human-like work is at work. It's absolutely essential. We're going to have a huge windfall. It's nowhere plateauing. Let's, let's keep it going for all these good wins. And it also is compatible with existing human workplace. You know, and the point is, let's not forget there is a big white space. So I, I say both. Uh, next up, uh, CDL Oxford, Katya. Uh, so to assume that some of the jobs uh, won't be automated with artificial intelligence is simply naive. I think that whether it's uh, human-like artificial intelligence or not, some of the jobs will go. And we can see already this happening. So it's legal services, you take virtual personal assistance, this is happening. NLP can replace some of the work. So, but let's talk more about um, other aspects. So, you are arguing, Eric, that actually incentives are wrong, and that's why most of the society are doing the wrong thing. So, I'm on the practitioner side. I'm an investor. Believe me, you know, I, most of the time I see new digital services created, not just simply substitution. So, we are investing capital in new things. Um, so, I would argue that actually capital, uh, penalizing capital uh, is the wrong thing to do. Let's look at the other side, what we are seeing a lot today, we are creating actually a new type of society. And this society, unfortunately, is less fair, more biased, and less inclusive. Let me just give you some examples. Like, I'm a, from my background, I'm an immigrant, and I have lived in 10 countries across three continents. Believe me, I know what is bias. And I'm a woman in technology, you name it. So our systems and knowledge becomes more and more centralized. So what happens? This bias that we have seen 10, 20, 30 years ago just becomes more amplified. We see it thousands of times amplified today. So what do we do about this? What do we do about including societies in the NLP which are not included, like Latin America? Uh, and what do we do about other things, polarizing artificial intelligence, where some are paid seven figures salaries to do artificial intelligence, and some are paid pennies to do labeling? So let me come to the last point, uh, and it's about, uh, you're arguing about productivity. So productivity, you're saying that actually can go in indefinitely and we have to focus on this. However, input in this equation is assumed to go close to zero. Artificial intelligence is not uh, cheap. We know that training one model is uh, tens of millions of dollars, and actually cost of carbon emission is equal to five cars in their lifetime. 
So cost for the planet is enormous. So just to give a question back and then I finish. So the question back is thinking about incentives. Can we come up with a better set of incentives beyond capital to address those issues? Thank you. Okay, Rich. Okay, well, Professor, I always uh, say, can I show some slides? So I guess I'm going to do that now. I have each slide's going to take eight seconds, I promise. For those of you who are bored, there are eight pop culture references in it, and you can send me a note if you can find them all. <laughs> so I think I just want to say AI is definitely a huge problem. You know, essentially our future is not a spectator sport. We can't just let this thing happen. The big, I'll just summarize. What do humans not reserve for themselves? It's a pretty short list. And the end game is, let's face it, mass unemployment, subjugation by AI robber barons, uh, or is it just all creative destruction? That's what you have to ask yourself. Uh, and the last thing is, the that's going to be very, very important. And how we follow those and how we write those are probably the most important thing, which is why I so much appreciated this session. So I guess the question is, what is not like human-like intelligence? Thing one is, well, we kind of define, this is, by the way, what psychologists define as human intelligence is basically pretty much everything. And you can see this, that inventions are actually quite uncontrollable. This is a chart that shows the first hand recognition tasks, which were done here in Canada. You can see it was pretty crappy at 28%. Who was to know that in 2014, we'd essentially exceed a human? The last number, by the way, is Andrew Karpathy taking the image test and proving that, in fact, we are we are not as good as a computer. We don't know when that's going to happen. I realized on this slide here that it's not augmentation or automation. It's all just creative destruction. So in many ways, we're at the perfect forum because it's so hard to predict what's going to happen. I personally would like to extend an apology to all the typists, mailroom people, voicemail people, and mobile bank and tech cashiers that I've put out of work in my, in my job. And I guess the last thing I want to say is, you have to realize we're on a huge elevator. This is the actual GDP of the world from 1 million BC on. And you can just list your date. And that will tell you exactly where you are in this ride. By the way, I did the calculation. We have approximately, if everyone were to become as productive as a Microsoft person, we have another 100x on top of this. Now, if you assume any growth, we're probably going to get to an 80 quadrillion dollar economy. So there's plenty to share if we do the right thing. Thank you. All right, well, I think that was just um, I feel like the genie is out of the bottle. Um, it's in the United States with the little image, which we're putting tons more of that earlier, and it's going to happen. You can't ban it in some kind of local competition. So if the West decided to pause, I don't think that would work. And it's already cheap enough to experiment with this at home, so you can't really bring it to the computer. It's so I feel like it's uh, too easy for people to experiment with this kind of technology. Um, secondly, building with a focus on human like intelligence is not actually limited. It can still result in surprises involved or interesting kinds of human systems. Think about chess play programs, which then surprise even chess experts with the uh, alien like nature of what they do. But the problem is they have to solve was still a human replacement problem. And even if we want machines to have some human capabilities, we still need to be able to correct or communicate with those machines. And this is probably the most important point, is that we still need to be aligned with the way humans interact with each other if you want them to be able to interact with humans when they're when they're uh, super intelligent machines. Incentivizing human assistive technology isn't going to work. There's no incentives possible, powerful enough to offset the dramatic economic gain that we're talking about replacing labor. I don't think that just changes tax codes to wrap that up. But trying to shift toward human augmentation as a way of keeping keep new labor value into the market is really going to happen. I think the end game is pretty clear, and we need something like universal basic income to make sure that there is still a consumer class that's out there to actually consume and buy the products that all these wonderful capital stores are able to produce it. So, um, in my opinion, although history shows increasing wealth disparity, and it's not plausible that we can reverse that, I think the rich will continue to get rich. But I'm hoping that we also have a rising time to solve those, and yeah, the folks in the low end of the economic spectrum are still supported by the great things that can come from this kind of project. Thank you.
All right, so we've laid it out. Uh, you're about to hear the closing arguments uh, to remind you the resolution. Be it resolved that human-like intelligence is the wrong focus for our work. Before we hear the closing arguments, we'll do a show of hands. I'll ask you to, uh, everyone, to please raise your hand for one or the other. In other words, no fence sitters. And then the debaters will get their final chance to change your minds. Uh, and there are we, I'm sure some people in this room who you know, are amused by all this and think it's, a, it's an academic exercise uh, and it's sort of out in the, per, you know, the periphery of what's important. And then there's a set of people in the room who probably uh, share a view that many of us have that it's of first order importance and it's reasonably immediate. So for those that agree with the resolution, be it resolved that human-like intelligence is the wrong focus for our work, please raise your hands. And can we quick, just keep your hands up, can we get a quick photo please? Photo of the hands and I want evidence of who's on this side. Thank you. And then hands up, those on Joshua's side, uh, be it resolved that human-like intelligence is the wrong focus for our work, you disagree. Hands up high. Okay, Joshua, it looks like you've got more work to do than Eric. So closing remarks, Professor Benjolson. Thank you. First off, I'm so happy to have this discussion because as a number of people have been saying, this is a really important issue. This is not hypothetical anymore. This is something that is going to be affecting all of us quite a lot with, quite soon. Uh, let me just very quickly touch on the points, these excellent points that the Sinead, Barney, Katya, Richard, Mark, and of course Joshua made. Uh, first off, I am not a techno-pessimist. I am uh, a techno-optimist. I've often called that. I, I think we should be even more ambitious. There's so much more we can do. I'm hoping for that 80 quadrillion uh, dollar economy and, and, and beyond that. Um, and I also want to say there's lots of room for plain old automation. And like, there's some things I would love to do. Um, and uh, I'm quite aware of that paper about the call centers where the uh, uh, technology was used to automate things. Um, but it was really more to augment things. The, the founders of that company specifically said they did not want to make a tool where you call in and talk to a robot. They wanted a tool where you call in and talk to humans because they thought that augmentation would work better. And it's got a north of a billion dollar valuation, so it's working out for them. Um, I could go into the incentives as people talked about, but I, I want to talk a little bit more, and I do think we have the wrong incentives. I mean, it's just mathematically there. But I want to talk more about a mindset change, which ultimately maybe will be more important even if economists have a harder time measuring it. Um, I think there's a real lack of creativity um, in simply mimicking humans, and I'm subject to it all the time. There's an existence proof. If we want to replicate something that a human is doing, it's easy to see what a human is doing, and then if you're a, a slightly lazy professor like me, you say, okay, go make a machine that does what we already see doing, and you're done. You can go, and the person will go off and work for a year or four years, and, and that's great. Um, but it takes a little more creativity to think, okay, what is something we could never have done before? And when I teach my MBA students, when I teach my executive classes, when I consult to, to companies, I'm constantly pushing them to think, look at some new possibilities, go beyond. You know, if Jeff Bezos had gone to a bookstore and said, hey, I can automate that bookstore. We're gonna put a robot where the cashier is, and then we're gonna have no more labor, the robot's gonna check people out. I think we all could agree that would be a pretty lame way to use the technology. Yes, you would automate it, but you're not thinking big enough. There's so many more things, so many new capabilities that Amazon made possible. And that's what I want to try to encourage, that broader possibility that goes way beyond anything that we're doing with humans. I agree very much that a big advantage of human-like intelligence is explainability. And that really gets to having humans and machines work more closely together. And I'm troubled that some of the recent technologies are going off in this path that are not explainable and makes it very hard for them to work with humans. To be working with humans, you need something that has some way of interacting with humans. And, and that's why that's an important area of research, not just to understand what the machine is doing, but to make it so that humans and machines can do more than the machine could on its own or the human could go on its own. And lastly, uh, I think it was uh, Mark that mentioned UBI. and We didn't get to that. I want to just briefly mention that uh, I can see that ultimately as being a path. But as an economist, the, the weakness of UBI is, among other things, it takes a lot of bargaining power away from the people who are receiving it. They're getting it as charity. And maybe 
our overlords will be very kind to us and give us the money, and I hope they will. They'll be generous and, and uh, magnanimous. But I would prefer a world where we had some bargaining power, where they had to pay us, where they had to give uh, money to us, because we were indispensable to production. Now, maybe at some point that path, that's going to be impossible, but for, I, I prefer as long as possible to have us be part of the production process that's required, have us augmenting, have us have humans in the loop, in fact, humans in charge, that's more likely to lead to a widely shared prosperity than one where we depend on the uh, kindness of whoever, Sam Altman and whoever else controls the ro robots. Thanks. And just, just before we start for the timer, uh, Eric got a few extra minutes at the beginning more than Joshua. Please uh, give Joshua a couple of extra uh, for his, if he needs it. It's okay. I, I understand. I won't need it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to make three points, but I want to start off with uh, uh, an experiment like uh, Jay does. Balana, can you go get me a uh, vanilla latte, please? <laughs> now, you can't see Balana, but here's what she's doing is like, and then, and then she's doing a command which Susan would say to her robot is giving the, me the finger. <laughs> now that, the, real, the reason why that occurs as opposed to Andreas's uh, uh, example of a J is because uh, uh, I have no authority in this regard. I, you know, in order to get the humans working and to do these tasks on your own, you have to have that authority. And one of the reasons I don't have the authority on this task with this particular person is because uh, that was a, a, what we would call a BS task. It is a task that no, nobody really wants to do uh, that, is, uh, that is being done, obviously in this case uncompensated, but whatever. whatever. And m much of the reason that I focus on human-like intelligence and still wanted is precisely because if you look at the litany of tasks that have really been substituted away from, they are BS tasks. They are invariably tasks that people do not want. We saw a, a venture here yesterday with burger flipping and the uh, idea of that automating that task was so that the workers who were expensive for the fast food chain could work on higher value things, uh, keeping uh, sanitary conditions up, making other things that might be more complicated, etc. So we, uh, that's why I want, a, in terms of the mindset Eric talks about, to us not to abandon the task of getting rid of uh, automating and human-like intelligence. The second point I wish to make, which I disagree uh, here, and there was another statement uh, yesterday from, from Barney, is I don't think any of this is inevitable. So I think it is possible to change mindset, incentives, institutions to actually change the path of AI. This is why this is a, not a, a, a vacuous debate, it's a serious debate. If someone, governments, powerful entities want to stop a direction, I think they can or they can mould it and change it. So this is why it's relevant. The question is, which direction do we want that to pursue? And then the, uh, 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 the final thing I want to say is that I want to thank Eric for, for coming here today. Apparently, we now have a new tradition at Supersession. We bring in very famous economists from around the world, and we beat them up in public. Um, and so I thank you very much for coming to do that. Thank you all. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. Uh, OK. You know, something just to take note of, interesting that didn't come up uh, in any of the discussion about this debate, uh, but if you open this week's Economist magazine, the lead story is about the population crisis. And it's not you know, a mythical story because we know exactly how many 18-year-olds there will be 18 years from now. And so the, you know, the argument in that essay is how on earth are we going to support all of the people that at that stage will be retiring uh, when we have so many fewer workers? Uh, that didn't even, there was, was never uttered once on either side of this debate. And so I suspect that the, uh, that the forces that shape the contours of how this all goes, uh, you know, everything's still in motion. So let me just uh, thank everybody who weighed in here because obviously the topic isn't one where there's a clear right or wrong answer. There's no definitive bookends. Uh, everything's moving under our feet. Uh, and it's moving so fast that we felt that it, 
our role at CDL at this super session was to catalyze the conversation amongst the builders. If we go to Ottawa, it's the policy in Washington and Geneva, it's the policy makers. If we go to the journalists, it's the storytellers and the talkers. If we go on Twitter, you know, it's the chattering classes. But if we go to this group here, this is the builders. These are the people who are actually building and making decisions of whether they're going to do it this way or that way. And so we thought, who better to be thinking about these issues? And you know, in the first day I asked Suzanne, you know, what do you think about the Daron's discussion? She said, why are you asking me? And she's right. You know, the builders are building. And they are doing that, uh, many of them, you know, far out ahead of where all the, the guardrails and the policymakers are going. You know, Joshua sent me an, a, an article. Um, it was uh, Fauci's testimony. And, you know, at the end of COVID, where he remarks, he said, you know, if I could go back, the one thing that I would change. Do you remember, Joshua, the, the thesis? Uh, in your words, how would you describe? He, would, he said, basically, I would bring... Uh, economists in on the decision making on COVID. In other words, he said, I'm a public health expert. I understand the implications of, you know, of epidemiology, but I don't understand the economic implications of shutting schools and shutting buildings. Why was I making that decision? So what we're trying to do here is bring together these groups of people, you know, the policy makers, the builders, the investors, everybody to uh, catalyze the conversation. Uh, so I thank the five of you for each, uh, you know, contributing. Uh, Joshua for making the arguments, and Eric for you know flying here from the West Coast in order to uh, to advance the side and the and the paper that you published that's precipitated this this whole event this morning, uh, the Turing Trap. Thank you very much.